We're doing okay. I'm George Bai, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. We're going to talk about some technical things, some exciting things we believe are going to reshape general aviation in part, and unmanned aerial systems and the potential of what all that might be. But one of the things that we want to do as a company is help address the culture of uh, what we're doing in the transportation sector and how it might impact us as a, as a country, as a world. And so speaking to groups like this is something that's important to us. We want to get the message out. So in kind of keeping with that, I really want to welcome and invite you to ask questions as we go. I know we have a Q&A at the end and we'll try to keep most of them towards the end, but if there's something I'm talking about tonight that you're, you just gotta ooh, 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 you know, please feel free to interrupt and we'll try to address it, maybe, uh, you know, make a note to bring that up in the Q&A time. Uh, I'm an engineer by training, a pilot as well. I was an Air Force uh, pilot, went to, uh, Desert Storm, uh, Raytheon after that for a while uh, through flight safety for T6 JPATs. I've been kind of in that whole military defense area for some years. Um, we did the Javelin project. Some of you may know of me and the, and the Javelin. Uh, and then of course, a couple of years ago, we talked about the electric Cessna uh, project and we're here today to kind of go to where we are now and what the potential holds for the future. Uh, who was here, was anybody here when we spoke a couple years ago, two and a half years ago? So there's three or four of us. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the audience, how many of us are engineers or technically oriented? Is there anybody that's just like, man, if you say watts or watt hours per kilogram, you're just way over my head. Are, are we, <laughs> there's an honest answer. How about media? Do we have media here tonight? Anybody that's associated with a newspaper or any kind of media? Okay, I will do my best to try to slow down when I get into technical things, but again, raise your hand if there's a little bit of explanation needed. But what, what we're here to talk about tonight is the, the persistence of flight that's possible with the kind of the four main technologies uh, and it's a continuation from the theme that we had with the elect electric Cessna project a couple years ago. Um, what you're looking at here is a prototype of what we call the strato air net. You can see the top of the wing has a kind of a blue surface to it. Uh, that, those are solar panels. You can see there's no intake as you would typically see with a conventional engine. Of course, that's not e needed because the airplane's not consuming oxygen. It's battery and electric motor propelled. You can see it's got a long wing and the construction underneath the wing is composite. So we've got a very light advanced structural material a very aerodynamic, sleek airplane that instead of running on uh, conventional fuel with an internal combustion engine is using the very latest in electric motor technology. And there's a little bit more underneath there too. But that's what we're going to talk about tonight. What's happening with propulsion? What's the potential with propulsion on an airplane, whether it's manned or unmanned, in fact? <coughs> Next slide. So prior to the electric system project, when we started by aerospace, we started uh, with the concept of utilizing solar, battery technology, electric motors in a smaller scale unmanned. And the Silent Falcon is the result. 13 foot wingspan, weighs about 25 pounds. A little airplane of this size typically would fly for an hour or two and have a small camera underneath to take pictures for mapping or 
wildlife. You know, um, in Alaska, it was just announced that uh, UAS has now had the FAA permission to uh, work with uh, BP, I think, right? Uh, up in Alaska. Yes, sir. I, I was just uh, seen on the internet too that uh, the FAA has granted uh, permission for uh, certain movies to be filmed commercially with uh, quadcopters and octocopters and things like that. You know, what's interesting about that, that's really cool. And that's, that's you know, we're looking to the future about how we can utilize airspace for these various types of research or security or whatever it might be. But imagine instead of having an hour and a half or two hours of flight endurance with a Puma from Air Environment, which is a great company, imagine having eight to 12 hours of endurance with a, with a same size airplane. And that's possible because of the solar collection on the top of the wings and the advanced high energy density batteries and the little uh, very, very efficient electric motor. Next slide. We won't talk about this very much tonight, but we're, we're also looking at manned aircraft. And again, kind of the continuation of the Cessna project into carrying people. But of course, when you carry people, people relative to uh, electronics tend to weigh a fair amount. <laughs> So if you're trading weight and performance, an aircraft like this is, you know, three, four, maybe five hour type of endurance rather than potentially perpetual flight. Next slide. So I'm going to do my best tonight to tell you what's real today. I'm going to look into the future and talk about where we're going. And of course, whenever you look into the future, you're, when you're future casting, you're, you know, we're not making promises, we're projecting. We're talking about what's possible, what the trends are, not what reality is. So where we are today, we're unveiling a technology demonstrator literally within a matter of weeks. Where we go with that tomorrow, I think, is unbelievable, truly fantastic. But just as a reminder, we'll try to uh, distinctly differentiate between today and tomorrow, okay? So, if you look at the slide here, you see Silent Falcon, you see the research that we've, that we've done with uh, Navy and with Cessna on that electric Cessna project, which flew some 25 times, by the way. Remember, uh, for those that were here, Charlie Johnson uh, was up here doing the uh, presentation with me, the uh, former Cessna uh, president and COO. He's with us uh, today still. And we flew that electric Cessna tremendous research and development project. But that's leading us to where we are today with a purpose-built aircraft, unmanned, unmanned. And there you see a picture uh, in the center, the yellow aircraft. Again, you can see the solar thin film photovoltaics on the top of the wing. That's the Electra One, and we're working with a company in Germany called PC Aero that we met years ago. But that's a purpose-built electric airplane, and you'll notice it's quite a bit different than a Cessna. It's quite a bit different than a Predator UAV. You notice the nose is very, very skinny. The electric motor we'll see here in a minute is quite small. It's about the size of a, of a watermelon. Very, very light, purpose-built, and that's taking us to the future, that base aircraft is taking us to the future with unmanned and manned systems. This is the airplane that we'll be seeing here in Colorado literally in a matter of weeks. So as I mentioned, um, we need the aerodynamics and we need the, the opportunity for the aerodynamics to contribute to the overall aircraft design as effectively as possible. When we're purpose-built electric, that's quite a bit different outer mold line or shape of the airplane as compared to uh, a Cessna, which is built around the large internal combustion engine. A Predator UAV is built around the Rotax engine or the turbofan engine. The light carbon structure 
um, literally means the fuselage and the wings are measured in tens of pounds rather than hundreds of pounds. And of course, a vehicle needs, ultimately, an aerospace vehicle, an airplane. You know, we, we need energy to lift. Energy required to maintain flight is lifting as well as propelling forward. So the lighter the structure, the lighter the airplane, the more the possibilities are for longer endurance flight and even perpetual flight. How many of us have read about the solar impulse? Solar impulse. Uh, out of uh, Europe, they've been flying a prototype. They flew across the United States, um, made some relatively short hops. The second generation solar impulse uh, just had its first flight, I think it was last week, if I, if I remember right. Very, very long wing, single pilot, top of the wings covered with, with uh, solar cells, just like we're talking about. But the absolute key to the performance of the solar impulse and what they're hoping to do as adventurers, <coughs> as adventurers, not as a practical airplane, it's an, it's a, it's a they're, they're trying to talk about what technology possibilities are and use this vehicle as a way to, you know, be casting the message. So it's not a practical airplane, but one of the things that Solar Impulse has done really, really well is lightweight structures. And they're risk takers. And I, I'll say that because when they uh, were working on the second prototype, the structure of the wing was so light that in testing they broke it. It snapped. Now you can imagine, okay, I'm going to be the pilot on that first airplane and oops, the, air, you know, the wing broke in testing. Doesn't exactly give you a, a, you know, a, a you know, power, power of, of confidence. And of course they've worked really hard to make sure the door comes off quickly so you can you know, bail out. <laughs> anyway, when you're advancing technology, however, when you're innovating, you have to be a risk taker. If you're not pushing the envelope, if you're not looking for what's, you know, not been pos possible up until now, you're not cutting new ground. So light rate structures and aerodynamics are critical. It's not just motor technology. It's not just higher energy density lithium ion batteries. New propellers. The uh, controller and the electronics. Boy, that's really cool. But it's also pushing the envelope on advanced structures, carbon fiber structures. And of course, uh, the solar energy. We've got good friends right up here with Ascent Solar. Um, their thin film photovoltaics is breaking new ground and converting solar energy into electric. And you know what? When you're, when you're up there, that's free electricity. That's, that's energy in the tank that I didn't have to carry aloft, that I didn't have to fill before I took off. How cool is that? Okay. So unlike two, three years ago, as we've scaled up, the technology has also advanced in scale. So today, it's possible today to have these breakthroughs at small scale, 8 to 12 hours, at larger scale, flying throughout the entire day, and in the very near future, stratospheric aircraft fly very, very high, and at least the potential with the technology is perpetual flight. And if, if that possibility, that promise for the future can be realized, the, 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 it's just stretching the imagination. I mean, just think of how many things can be done with a vehicle like that that we're needing to do today on satellites, for example. And how expensive, even if it's a small satellite, how expensive that can be. You know, we're downsizing the size of satellites. They're, you know, shoebox size now, the, the very small satellites. But imagine that you, we didn't even need to do that anymore. 
that the operating costs on an hourly basis were under $10 an hour. And that's just a reserve financial account to replace batteries on occasion. That the electricity, the, the power to fly, was effectively free from the sun. And imagine that we weren't emitting any toxic fumes, that we weren't burning petroleum anymore to do this kind of flying, that we didn't have to launch a rocket to get there. It's amazing if you think about what the potential is. So obviously it's a complex task. There's many things that have to be done to do it. Integrating the complete system is not trivial. Working together, of course, with customers. Many people have different ideas about what kind of payloads need to be in, and that's a major task all in, of its, in and of itself. Unmanned systems can carry all kinds of things. And of course, you're not carrying a person, certainly not for that kind of endurance or flight persistence. You wouldn't want to. But by not having a human in the loop, by using auto flight controls, of course, we can save tremendous weight. And by reducing the amount of weight that we have to carry to altitude, that again translates into that persistent flight. Now from, well, one, just one more point here. Um, from a defense perspective, I think most of the market now we're talking about is commercial. But from a defense perspective, it's also interesting if that's a market that's you know, part of the, the potential utility of, of an unmanned system, that electric has some unique characteristics in the sense that there's very low, almost zero thermal signature. There's very low heat. There's not a lot of bright, hot exhaust. Very low heat. The propeller on an electric vehicle, an electric airplane, turns relatively slowly. And there's no exhaust noise from the, from the engine running. So the acoustic signature is about 55 decibels, which is less than half the noise signature of even a small general aviation airplane. So uh, for those that have heard unmanned systems, like a Predator fly overhead, or even some of the smaller ones, a Puma or a Raven or something like that, sounds like a lawnmower is flying overhead. You know, wah. And there's a very hot exhaust. They're easy to find and easy to hear, easy to locate. And of course, they can't fly, they can't stay aloft for very long, so you can kind of just check your watch and they're on their way. But imagine there was no heat signature. There was no noise signature. And they could stay and persist and listen and watch. Again, for those in the defense community or security or homeland defense, if it's Coast Guard, if it's search and rescue, if it's petroleum platform security, if it's cargo transport, whatever it might be, you can just imagine the possibilities. But again, that ultra long endurance combined with the environmental benefits of no exhaust emissions together with low thermal and low acoustic. Okay. So we think the potential is exciting and effectively it's immediate. We'll be flying very, very soon, um, both with the technology demonstrator as well as with, with the aircraft as they, as they are developed in the coming six to eight months, 10 months. We really think, um, again, most of the potential is in that commercial realm, okay? We've seen uh, UAV forecasts. This is one of uh, the many popular ones from Forecast International. Um, of course, what's in this forecast it looks very compelling, very interesting, but it doesn't include the possibility it wasn't even imagined when this forecast was put together that the impact, the, the kind of impact we might have from a solar electric vehicle that could stay aloft perpetually. So this is exciting in and of itself, but imagine adding another layer or two on top of this. 
So the mission list, um, we'll try to kind of give some ideas about what they might include at medium altitudes. And of course, when you're not consuming oxygen in an internal combustion engine, we talk about high altitudes too. So let's look at, let's look at medium altitudes. One of the things uh, that's really concerning for us here in Colorado and in the western states is uh, forest fires. Well, imagine if we had a perpetual infrared camera overhead the, the, uh, the Rocky Mountains. And from medium to, to high altitudes, you can see large segments of the front range. Instead of waiting until a report came in from an from a isolated location, imagine having effectively an instantaneous infrared signature of a lightning strike and analyzing it as a fire with a multispectral camera and an infrared camera. Imagine being able to immediately respond to that campfire size issue rather than you know, a major forest fire that had to be responded to with, with huge resources. So you know, we, we look at somewhat conventional search and rescue, emergency response and things like that, but again, imagine the possibilities at altitude of an unmanned system providing protection for our natural resources right here in Colorado. Go ahead. And then high altitude, you know, we've seen uh, Facebook and Google and uh, others talk about, you know, communication and media, you know, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. Establishing a ground network and towers and so forth for cell towers or media or uh, just internet is a tremendous expense, billions and billions and years and years. An airborne high altitude antenna, if you will, that's linked with satellite bringing to a, a region the ability to communicate where you don't need to set up those cell towers and that infrastructure can be a tremendous tool for those in the world that today don't have uh, connectivity, if you will. Now typically on an unmanned system, on a UAV like a Predator, we have a, a sensor ball. The Westcam MX-15 is, is one example. They, you'll have uh, four or five cameras of different types from a high definition uh, color camera to infrared, multispectral, Sometimes there's a, a laser involved and things like that. But this is a typical example of what might be carried in a, a Strato AirNet UAV. It's integrated into the airplane, but of course what we're trying to do is get the information, the, the tool of the, of the UAV is translating information gathered at altitude to somebody, of course, that needs to collect it on the ground. And you want that real time as much as possible. So this shows how that sensor system on the platform that we're creating is integrated into systems on the ground for the, for the users. And of course, we begin to look at what the possibilities are for the future. All of the nanotechnologies, the, the miniaturization of the technology is benefiting us directly. Digital cameras and things, again, hyperspectral, multispectral allows agricultural research, mineral uh, research. There's all kinds of benefits that can come when you can expand the possibilities of the data that's collected. So the airplane itself, we have that technology demonstrator that's coming out followed by an optionally piloted airplane. Again, it's called the Strato AirNet. It is rather conventional in this configuration. As we take it into the production configuration, it gets a little bit more complex. But you can see, roughly it's a 1,000 pound airplane with solar on the wings, the electric motor, batteries, and so forth. And we'll get, show you a little bit, some pictures of that. So this is a structural analysis. This allows this 
technology for structural analysis called finite element analysis allows us to make that structure as absolutely light as possible by ensuring that we have the structure only where we need it, where the stress points are and not where it's not needed. So technology benefits the design engineering as well as the material used uh, for the uh, fuselage. And of course aerodynamics aren't just done in the wind tunnel anymore, they're done virtually. Computational fluid dynamic analysis allows us to do virtual wind tunnel testing. And uh, it's, it really allows us to fine tune the aerodynamics as well as the loads on the airplane. So again, technology allowing us to really refine this aircraft even before it flies. When we spoke last, we were at about 160 watt hours per kilogram in terms of battery energy density. Today, we're at 250 watt hours per kilogram. By the time we go into production, we expect to be at 400 watt hours per kilogram. This is an image of the battery pack being assembled. You can see the cells being assembled together in units. The battery management system, which allows the monitoring of the temperature and the voltage and the, and the uh, charge and so forth. And then, of course, the finished box. Four boxes, four battery packs per aircraft. The electric uh, motor, very, very powerful, very energy dense. Um, and you notice behind the motor is a small box. When we were doing the electric Cessna project, that box, the controller, was as big and as heavy as the motor. Now the box is all digital, and you can see it's not much bigger than a, uh, well, a couple decks of cards, and it weighs about 10 ounces. Over, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, sorry, yeah, just real quick. Uh, no, no, the, the motor is 10 kilograms. The controller is about 10 ounces. Literally a, a couple of, of uh, digital decks inside there. Motor weighs about 9 kilograms. Next slide. And here, here you can see the, uh, the wing being assembled. So what we're doing is certainly advancing the overall, the culture of aviation from a manned and unmanned system, but, but clearly we think we're cutting edge as well with a practical solution. And, and of course, by being relatively small and lean, we have an advantage over perhaps a Boeing or an Airbus or someone like that that would otherwise perhaps have more resources than we would have. But by their very nature, the bureaucracy would, would be relatively s slow to integrating and putting an aircraft in, in flight. I, I love this slide, but rather than spending a lot of time in the, in the details here, you can kind of see where, again, that light, lean uh, organization would have an advantage over a larger uh, organization like a, a major OEM. So as I mentioned, there are others that are doing this. You see the uh, solar impulse over on the right-hand side. You have a, a typical um, Predator aircraft. There's a Global Hawk, which is a very large uh, unmanned system, much larger, about twice the size of a Predator. And then there's the uh, Solera 50. And the Solera 50 um, prototype, the 10-meter wingspan prototype there you see is the one that uh, Facebook and Google were kind of, you know, negotiating for in the, uh, in the media. I don't know if they were negotiating in, in business conference rooms, but they were certainly negotiating in the media. We are um, quite a bit s smaller, but conventionally configured as opposed to Strato, or as uh, Strato AirNet as, co as compared to the Solera 50. You can see they have a very fragile, very light, thin, uh, approach to the uh, air vehicle. 
One of the distinctives that we have, I think, is an extraordinary team. And some of them are, are here tonight. We're very grateful for that. But I think in terms of bringing to market a new technology, it's really cool to have something that's advanced, but you've, you've got to have the substance and the depth to help make it realized. And so as a business, our strategy certainly is you know, advancing the cause and advancing the technology, but we're doing it with an experienced team. Because it's not going to matter if you just talk about it. You've got to have hardware and you have, some, have to have something that you can bring to market. You have to have something, a need that gets answered and a market that's willing to pay for that need. So we're organized not just for research, which is cool. We're organized as a business to bring to market this tool, whether it's unmanned or manned. We, uh, we've kind of spoke to our experience in the past, but, but certainly it's uh, significant in design and development. The uh, smaller Silent Falcon that I mentioned here as I be began the discussion is in low rate initial production. So that 13 foot wingspan, 25 pound small solar electric aircraft is now beginning to get commercialized. So we're very excited about that, very cool. And as I mentioned, uh, in the weeks ahead, you'll also hear from us a little bit about a manned version of the technology demonstrator. If you kind of take the core technology, follow it to an unmanned system, that's Strato AirNet. If you follow it the other way, it's a, a manned aircraft. And in the weeks and months ahead, we'll be talking about this a little bit more. But just to kind of let you know it's coming. It's not just about unmanned systems. Of course, it's about carrying people aloft. And if you can imagine, again, you know, what matters to us as a nation, as a culture, as a, uh, an industry, transportation industry segment, when you can carry people, that brings, a, again, another transportation realm that's interesting and important. If you can imagine a Tesla with wings and carry that into what the future might hold, that's also exciting. And this will be the first entree into that. So we think we have a very exciting company and team. Uh, the technology from multiple segments is coming together and being synthesized and realized into a technology demonstrator that will be flying very, very soon. And then we'll be going on into that unmanned strato air net with various payloads with perpetual flight for the first time really in the realm of the possible in the near term. And of course, on the other, other branch of the tree, there's the, there's the uh, manned system that we'll be uh, introducing in the weeks ahead. Uh, thank you, that's, that's the uh, presentation tonight. I'd be delighted to talk a little bit more if you have some questions. Uh, and I'll, uh, the question was time to climb and when what are some of the expectations again from a time to climb perspective, you know, we, th we think in terms of a, of a Cessna 172 perhaps flying and climbing in you know, 750, 800 feet per minute. And in the optionally piloted configuration, this aircraft would climb at about the 700 feet per minute rate of climb. So it would be pretty similar to what you might expect uh, a conventional general aviation airplane. Um, what's more interesting, though, is how much energy does it take to sustain flight? About six kilowatts of energy to fly 50 knots, for example. And that, that is the extraordinary combination of aerodynamics, light structure, and, and very streamlined fuselage. That's where it really gets exciting. Because if you can balance the energy of what you're collecting from solar during the day, store it for nighttime flight, together with, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the little bit of the trading potential energy during, during the night for, for drift down, as well as slowing down. Again, for those of us with a little bit of physics and engineering, you know, drag is propor proportional to V squared. 
So if you fly slow, your drag goes way down, and what you have to overcome with thrust goes way down. So slow down during night time operations when you want to conserve that energy. So balancing solar collection with nighttime ops and potential energy and so forth, that's the key. What about the cold performance of Great question. You know, it comes up a lot. People say, well, you know, lithium batteries or batteries in general don't perform very well in cold temperatures. Well, you know, that's important only when you start on the ground because as power is consumed, there's a thermal element with the batteries themselves as well as the electric motor. 95% efficient, but the other 5% is heat. So if you're properly containing the thermal in the motor and battery compartment, once it's in operation, again in that, in that cycle, that heat is self-sustaining, is helping protect the full potential of the batteries. And of course, if you have a cold start, it's minus 50 you're in Minnesota or Alaska, you want to have those battery packs, of course, kept in the, in, the, in the warm shed and bring them out and plug them into your bit check and you're on your way. The question had to do with uh, other types of batteries beyond the lithium systems. And certainly there are uh, tremendous uh, opportunities with other battery storage systems. Um, and we are looking at those. One of the things that we're looking at is a, is a fuel cell technology to get to altitude. And then, of course, that fuel is consumed in the, in the climb to altitude and no longer needed. So it's, you've kind of traded the weight, weight and energy to, to do the, the climb to altitude. Um, and then you're sustained from that point on in the, in the perpetual loop. But yes, of course, what we're doing is we're, we're creating a configuration that's accepting of the, these types of technologies because we're using electric propulsion. But, but do you think lithium is going to get to 400? Uh... There's technology in the lab today in production configuration that's 400 watt hours per kilogram. Now, uh, there's other technologies that are talking about that and more. And of course, in time, how cool is that? That's great. But today, you know, near term, what we're going to fly with and what we're looking to uh, go into production with, we'll, we'll start with that anyway. Yes, sir. The question had to do with how, how are we comparing, you know, with an electric system, propulsion system, uh, as compared to a conventional fossil fuel system? And where's kind of the tipping point with efficiency and so forth as compared to a fossil fuel. Well, well clearly fossil fuels are very energy dense, uh, but there's lots of problems with them as we, as we all know. This audience well, is well familiar with those challenges. We think with today's technology, the technology demonstrator is the correct solution with that kind of 250 watt hours per kilogram, the electric motor density, in the thin film photovoltaics at 23 to 25% conversion efficiency. Our predicted production aircraft, in our view, has achieved the tipping point. And that's taking us to 30% solar conversion efficiency with a thin film PV. That's taking us to the 400 watt hours per kilogram with the uh, energy density of the batteries. We believe in the collection that is the tipping point. And when you can talk about collecting energy, solar energy, and there's other energy that's solar aloft as well. And maybe another time we'll talk about that. I, I know we've got to watch our time. Um, but when you can talk about perpetual flight, when you're no longer having the logistics and the requirement for fossil fuel consumption at all, we really believe that is, that is a tipping point. And that, of course, realizes the potential of so many other applications that maybe haven't even been imagined today. So I think it's the, the time is now for technology demonstration and in the very near future we can project the lines of where that technology is taking us in our view to that tipping point.
Yes, sir. How am I doing on time, by the way? Last question? Last question. How many passengers Well, <laughs> um, of course, the unmanned system is zero, right? It's the, it's the you know, the, auto, the, auto, it's the autopilot passenger pilot person thing. Um, we're starting with, on the conventional manned aircraft, a two-person. Two now the technology demonstrator, of course, is going to have a single pilot. So we'll, you'll be seeing that literally within weeks here. Um, but we're not starting with auto flight. We don't, we don't want to, you know, there's so many issues with the FAA and airspace. You know, there's so many important things we can do today. We don't need to wrestle with the FAA with airspace right now. Let's show the technology. Let's get excited about its potential. Let's look at applications and talk to customers. That's what's immediately in front of us. But that will lead to an unmanned system on the one hand and initially a two-seater on the manned side. Now, can we add passengers as those technologies mature? You bet we can. But that comes later. That comes later. Maybe not too far down the road. Do you have an investor package? <laughs> well, actually, we'll, I'll, the gentleman right to your right could, could talk to you about that. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, it's been a delight, everybody. Thank you so much.